Thank you very much, Annette, and thank you for the invitation to this conference. I, I would have loved to go back to IPAM next time, I guess. Uh, one small correction, I'm now at Stony Brook, so I just started in January. Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, wow. I, I, okay. I don't think anybody knew. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, right, so um, I'll be talking about what Anna said, so uh, anomalous dissipation and, and passive scalar transport, and, and this is joint with, work with Tarek Elgindi, Gaud Amir, and uh, Inji Jong. Uh, and um, so the motivation, let me just start by saying what that is. So it's from Navier Stokes' Turbulence, and um, Everybody here, I think, is familiar with this, but there's this concept of the zeroth law of turbulence. So, of course, the behavior is chaotic and unpredictable, but there are certain features that everybody agrees are turbulent features. One of them is anomalous dissipation, and this is what's often termed the zeroth law. So if you look at the energy dissipation rate, uh, non-dimensionalized by the, a characteristic velocity cubed over L, then uh, this quantity tends to uh, a limit that's non-zero as Reynolds number goes to infinity. And this is anomalous because energy dissipation rate is a quantity that implicitly uh, or explicitly requires Reynolds number to be not infinite, but somehow in this limit, it survives despite um, Reynolds number going to infinity. And this is, of course, related to, as we now know from for a long time, this is related to the fluid developing small scale structures. And so one way to quantify uh, the small scale structures emerging is through um, what are termed structure functions. So these are essentially LP norms of velocity increments, which depend on a certain length scale L. So that's a parameter in the structure function. And turbulent fluids um, display certain ranges of scales over which these objects uh, look up, uh, approximately like this. They scale with some fractional power. So Kolmogorov 1941 theory predicts that uh, the power scaling for the pth order structure function, so the moment is p, is p over 3. And um, Ansager in 1945 um, realized that actually when p equals 3, this exponent is the threshold for whether or not the fluid can actually sustain this type of behavior. So you required that amount of irregularity in order to have dissipation not going to zero. Okay. So, okay, let me just say one more thing. Of course, the, the big goal, I think, or one big goal is to understand this process. And there has been a lot of effort in this direction, multiple directions towards this goal. Um, one of them notably is on constructing weak solutions of the Euler equations, which accomplish, um, well, which have a certain degree of regularity and uh, can dissipate kinetic energy. But notably, none of the constructions correspond to zero viscosity limits or infinite Reynolds number limits. And really, this is the process that we're interested in understanding. So the subject of this talk will be on a much simpler problem, a linear problem. It'll be on passive scalars. So passive scalar theta, uh, which I'll decorate with a kappa, just satisfies an advection diffusion equation. So advection diffusivity kappa by an incompressible velocity field, yet unspecified. Um, and we'll consider initial data, which is, which is mean zero, and we'll work on the torus. So this represents a temperature or die being just pushed around by the fluid velocity. And a direct calculation shows that if you look at the rate of change of, uh, of scalar energy, um, this is dissipated by the uh, thermal diffusivity with the gradients of the scalar. And as we heard just in, in Gadam's talk before, although the velocity doesn't play a direct role in this balance, as in you don't see it here. Um, of course, it has a lot to do with how effective the scalar dissipates its energy. In particular, the velocity uh, can give rise dynamically to very small scale structures, and that makes um, uh, the Laplacian strong. It makes this uh, um, dissipation term more powerful. 
Okay. In fact, um, there's an analogy, a direct analogy between the zeroth law of turbulence and uh, a zeroth law of scalar turbulence, which is anomalous dissipation of scalar fluctuations. And this has, again, very strong experimental support. And there's a nice paper, a numerical paper by Diego Danzen and, and Srinivasan in 2005, which show very clearly um, this behavior. So namely that the uh, dissipation due to thermal diffusivity of the scalar is bounded strictly away from zero, um, independent of the diffusivity kappa. Okay, um, so now, well, the fact that those two phenomena are so similar um, means that there are also very similar theoretical sort of underpinnings. So there was work of Abakov in 1949 and Corson in, in 1951, which paralleled the work of Komogorov and Ansager. So I'm going to paraphrase what the content of their theory is, and I'll take some creative license. It's not exactly what I'm saying, but so what they essentially say is that a turbulent velocity field, which is in, let's say, Holder C alpha, this is not really the right space to say, but let's say that, um, with some alpha between zero and one, gives rise to or develops a, a, a scalar field in this turbulent regime, which is C beta, where beta is related to alpha like this, one minus alpha over two. And actually this relationship between beta and alpha, it, it can be understood as an endpoint case of an Ansager type theorem. So I'll just state that. So if you have a velocity that is C alpha, say L1 in time, the values in C alpha, um, which is incompressible, and you have a family of diffusive scalars, which is uniformly bounded in this uh, C beta space, then you have this bound on the scalar, the, the total dissipation. So in particular, if beta is bigger than that value that I set up here, the dissipation goes to zero, like some power of the diffusivity. Okay, so in particular, there's no anomalous dissipation. And in that way, you can understand uh, the theory of Abakov and Corson as just the minimal requirement that you would have uh, for the scalar in order to be consistent with this object not going to zero as diffusivity goes to zero. Now, for the subject of the, the present talk, I'm going to just extend this a little bit. So if you assume that the velocity is not just L1 C alpha, but in fact, it's locally L1 uh, W1 infinity, so Lipschitz, but the Lipschitz norm can blow up at a particular time T, uh, then uh, you have the dissipation going to zero, even if beta is equal to one minus alpha over two. So just the endpoint case. Basically, it's just saying that if your flow is actually better for most of the time and just degenerates at one point, you can say a lot more. Now, there are, there are no examples, um, or there were no examples that were deterministic that um, exhibit the behavior of anomalous dissipation for the scalar. So there no sort of negative side to these statements. Uh, there was work on a random model called the Kraikman model, which maybe we could talk about in, in the breakout room, which is related, but nothing deterministic. Okay. So in, in light of that, the, the subject of the talk and the main result of the work is an example that demonstrates uh, this behavior. So in particular, fix any T in any dimension bigger than or equal to two, any alpha between zero and one, and some initial theta, say in H2, um, then there exists a divergence-free velocity field U, such that the scalar dissipation is strictly bounded away from zero by some number chi that can depend on the initial data for the scalar and the uh, holder regularity of the velocity field alpha, okay? So I'll tell you a little bit about the proof of this, but before I do, let me first make a couple of remarks and draw some implications. So the first remark is that in our construction, the scalar field retains no holder regularity whatsoever, okay? And um, in fact, what it shows is that this endpoint case um, 
over here. So alpha is allowed to be arbitrarily close to one and theta is, and beta is zero for us. So this endpoint case um, is, is sharp. I mean, we have an example where the opposite behavior of that previous theorem holds when beta is zero. And in, in that sense, uh, this result demonstrates the sharpness of the Abakov course in theory insofar as it's the endpoint case of these Ansager theorems. Um, at the end of the talk, I'll make some remarks about potentially more interesting um, extensions where this theory uh, may hold. Okay. First, um, there's a very quick and easy implication of the above theorem, which probably you um, already see, uh, concerning non-uniqueness of weak solutions of inviscid transport equation. So this is the inviscid transport equation, just no diffusivity. And um, it's well known that uh, if you have, say, bounded initial data and L1 and time W11 drift, then you have de Perna leons theory for uniqueness of weak solutions. And when you go to lower regularity, there are a number of counterexamples to, to uniqueness. So um, at least it goes back at least to Eisenman, and, and then there are actually many references. Let me just highlight this one, um, Alberti, Bianchini, and Kripa. They uh, give an example of an autonomous uh, divergence-free velocity field, which is C alpha for any alpha less than one, uh, which has the property that weak solutions of this system are not unique. Okay. So the theorem that we proved has a, a similar implication, although it's weaker. It gives the example. It gives an example of um, an L1 in time C alpha velocity field for which there are multiple weak solutions. So it's weaker because now this velocity field is time dependent. Um, but the proof is a direct consequence of the previous result. Um, in fact, it just consists of you take the velocity field that, that worked in the previous theorem, whatever the construction gave you, and you just piece it together. So at some a certain time, uh, let's call it t over 2, you, you go with that velocity field up till that time. And then after that time, you, you reverse it. You time reverse that velocity field. Now, the two weak solutions are um, kind of simple. So one of them comes from vanishing viscosity limit. Since it's a linear equation, you have weak convergence implying your weak solution of the limit system. So the vanishing viscosity limit, as we proved, actually loses energy. So in particular, the weak limit has less energy than its initial data. And that all happens on this interval where the theorem applies. And then when you switch the velocity and you run backward in time, you don't gain energy back if you're a diffusive limit. You just can't increase in energy ever. And it's monotonic. So that gives you one weak solution whose energy decreases. On the other hand, there's another weak solution, which is just the time reversal of that first piece. It doesn't come from a zero diffusion limit, but um, it exists. And that reaches at the final time its initial data. Okay, so it's a very sim simple simple construction. Are there any questions? Should I, uh, maybe I briefly pause and ask any question? Oh, okay. Um, so now I just wanna say a few words about the proof of the main theorem. So it, it relies on a lemma that essentially shows that uh, balanced growth uh, implies you have anomalous dissipation. And what do I mean by that? So uh, let's work in the, the setting where the velocity is Lipschitz up to a certain time and the norm could diverge at this time t. And suppose you have a solution of the inviscid problem with the property that the time integral of the h1 square of the solution actually diverges as you approach that time t. Okay, so uh, moreover, suppose that the... Um, um, square of the H1 norm is bounded below by some small constant, say, times the H2 of both the inviscid and the viscous one and the diffusive one. So this is what we mean by balanced growth, 
this interpolation would go the other way, but here you're really saying that uh, one derivative square is like two derivatives. Okay, so if you can find such uh, uh, an inviscid scalar, and there is some condition on the viscous one too, then as a consequence, uh, the dissipation of the corresponding diffusive problem is bounded below by something involving this constant and the initial data. So, so this is sufficient for establishing anomalous dissipation. And the proof is, is very simple, but I think I'm going to skip it because there's not too much time. So with that in hand, let's see how one could construct um, uh, an inviscid scalar with that property. What we'll use are building blocks that are alternating shears that become increasingly sharp and higher frequency. So the basic building blocks is what we call this S epsilon. It's like a regularized sawtooth. So there's some region of width epsilon um, over which the, the sharp corner is replaced by some uh, smoothness, smooth thing. And um, this function has the property that the derivative is bounded, but the second derivative is like one over epsilon. And out of this, we build shear flows. So either a horizontal shear or a vertical shear, they could go in either direction and it's at a certain frequency, okay? And these parameters, n and epsilon, and in fact, the direction of the shear are very important for the construction. So what we do is we, we have a, a fixed interval, say zero to one in time, which we just break up diadically. And we have um, these uh, progression of frequencies and sharpenings so that uh, this shear, say this base shear acts for half the time, um, then you, know, you, you switch and go to a higher frequency and you keep switching and this rapidly um, uh, converges at one to something that's, it will end up being just L1 in time, C alpha, where, where this is the alpha. Okay. And this is going to be the velocity field that will allow us to accomplish that balanced growth of the inviscid norms. Okay, so um, the, the main point is that if you have a shear flow, uh, the transport equation is just directly solvable. So you can get recurrence relations between um, how the scalar acts on these different uh, intervals of time. And okay, there's some work to this, but then you can show that essentially those, um, so you can show first of all growth, um, quantify the growth of the H1 norm of the inviscid scalar, but also that those balanced relations hold um, in this setting. And again, there's some work behind this, but I don't have time to discuss that. One thing I'd like to highlight though, is that the direction of the velocity field, which way it's going, actually matters in our construction and it depends on the particular initial data that we choose. So in order to really ensure balanced growth, instead of say the second derivative growing much faster than the first derivative square, we need to choose um, the direction so that along the iteration, uh, uh, some things have good signs that don't unbalance the growth. Okay, so extending this to all data is an interesting open issue that I'll briefly talk about at the end. The velocity field, as I said, you can check is, is L1 C, C alpha for any alpha less than one. Okay, so um, now uh, I want to make a couple of remarks about um, some context um, and also some open directions. So there's this famous conjecture by Bresson, which is a quantitative lower bound on the mixing norm, um, which involves the L1 norm of the gradient of the drift. And I think everybody here is very familiar with this, but okay. Um, if you replace L1 by L infinity, then this is a simple consequence of, of Gronwall. Um, then there was this uh, work by Kripa and Delelis that replaced in this lower bound uh, L1 by LP for P just bigger than one. And there are also examples 
um, by Anna, among others, which show that this can this lower bound can be achieved. Um, we would like to propose uh, a similar type of uh, quantification. So our question is, does there exist some rate that depends on kappa now, such that the L2 norm of the diffusive problem has some quantitative lower bound? And in this case, instead of being a single exponential, now the, the sort of relevant thing is this double exponential lower bound, which can be, for example, seen directly if you replace L1 by L infinity. This is the argument of Poon and is also in this paper by Miles and Doring. Um, but, okay, so in general, can you have such a bound? And it turns out after we, we had put out our paper that uh, Brew and Wynn uh, recognized that the correct rate is uh, logarithmic in the diffusivity and proved some partial results establishing this lower bound, although um, in general it's open. And of course, the significance of this relative to the problem that we were talking about is that a lower bound on the energy is an upper bound on the dissipation. So um, if any such bound holds with Cap, uh, with R of kappa going to zero, then the dissipation would necessarily vanish as kappa goes to zero, perhaps with a very slow rate, maybe logarithmic. Um, but uh, we have an example, of course, that if you're if you're just here, then no such bound can hold. Just to put it in that context. Oh, and this is also open um, just for replacing L1 by LP, the analog of this result for the inviscid problem. Okay, maybe I have like two minutes or something. Yes. Okay, so in those two minutes, uh, let me just highlight some open issues. Um, one is that, as I said, the construction doesn't work for all data that we have. It's sort of, there. there is a class of data for which you can make it universal, but then if you want to do any data, it has to be tailored. And so it would be very nice to have an example of a drift that uh, makes the scalar dissipate anomalously for all data. And so one maybe promising idea here is to somehow randomize it and get some um, statement there. Uh, another thing which I think is very interesting is to show somehow that this Abakov course in theory is always sharp, at least in a mathematical sense. So the question is, does there exist a divergence-free a drift, which is C alpha, um, and smooth initial data, say, for the scalar, such that this family is uniformly bounded in the C beta space with, with all beta less than this threshold value. And moreover, that this limit is, uh, pos is positive. I mean, at least this, this thing is bounded away from zero. So the significance of this is that you, you have dissipation with, with sort of scalar exactly at that threshold space. But now there's this interesting interplay. As you make the velocity rougher, this, this number gets larger. So a rougher drift corresponds to a more regular um, um, uh, scalar. And so there's some sort of regularization by roughness that you would have to embrace to actually prove such a thing. And I'll just remark that in the Kirkman model, a uh, rigorous version of this is actually true. So there's, um, at least in a statistical sense, you can show that the scalar in, in an L2-based space has this, has this regularity exactly. So there is hope that such a thing can be accomplished. And here I'm just asking if it could be true on a deterministic construction. And finally, um, could one establish a similar lemma that I showed earlier that relates an Euler blow up, a putative Euler blow up, to uh, anomalous dissipation for Navier Stokes? Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>